You're listening to Weird and Dead, the paleontology podcast that tells evolution's most embarrassing and bizarre stories. I'm Megan Weatherell. And I'm Amy Atwater, and we are two living scientists who are weirdly excited about dead things. On this episode, we'll talk about the fact that animals seem to show up in random places separated by vast oceans in the fossil record. And the only possible method for their transport was letting Jesus take the storm debris and push them to safety. We will also measure things in whales, Mm -hmm. discuss how naps can help you survive the sea, and find out in great detail what the hell a chameleon actually is. Also lemurs! Yay! Yay! Like always, our podcast talks about some disgusting things, so maybe don't sit with your family members while listening to this episode and check the warnings in the description. Thank you. One of the things that I want to start with is talking about some of my favorite animals on the planet, which are lemurs. Mm. People who know me well know that I love lemurs. Lemurs are a type of primate. Yes, including humans. Humans are also primates. Megan is going to taunt me mercilessly throughout this entire podcast about how lemurs and apes and all of them are all monkeys. They're all monkeys. They're all monkeys. And for the fact that I love her, I let this slide. (laughs) However, I'm going to state right off the bat that there are technically three major groups of primates alive today. We've got our prosimians, which include our lemurs, the cute lorises, like the slow loris, and also tarsiers, the bug-eyed guys that look like they've had way too much coffee. Then we have the monkeys. They represent a little bit higher branch on the uh, primate evolutionary tree. And then we have apes, which include us fine amazing human beings as well we are nothing but bipedal hairless weirdly ginormous brained apes and since this is a podcast i do want to describe what happens to amy when you call all of these things monkeys there's a little bit of just like a sparkle of sudden rage in her eyes and her nostrils flare ever so slightly it has gotten a lot more managed over time but that is part of why i call them monkeys it's really funny to watch you (laughs) Exposure therapy is something my my therapist encourages me to (laughs) engage in more often. So keep it coming with the monkey madness. So (laughs) we're going to start with lemurs here Mm -hmm. and not necessarily um, monkeys. We are going to talk about monkeys a little bit today. But lemurs, I mean, normally you're not going to encounter lemurs if you're not at a zoo. And then really in the wild, you're only going to find lemurs existing in one place today in the entire globe. And that is the island of Madagascar, to the point where there are a lot of movies now about the lemurs of Madagascar, which are... mm, perfection by the way just so good the diversity of lemurs that they show is just really great did i watch it for research no but now i'm gonna go watch it after this so what is really cool to me though and my first kind of surprise in our episode is that lemurs did not actually originate in madagascar they didn't evolve on the island of madagascar even though today that is the only place where they're found lemurs actually lived all over the planet in their early days back in the Eocene about, you know, 56 to about 30. Well, they all died out by about 43 million years or so ago, except for that weird one. Um, anyway, we're, we won't need to talk about Egimoe Shashla today, <laughs> which I am not pronouncing correctly. <laughs> And that's just really fascinating that, again, I, you have been with me in the field while we've been finding some of these early prosimian fossils. I found a probably like 50 million year old lemur jaw in Wyoming on a field trip in which I cried on the outcrop and made my advisor <laughs> extremely uncomfortable <laughs> with my emotional experiences. And that's really fascinating that lemurs, you know, prosimians, we're not entirely sure where they actually originated. There's a lot of debate if it was Africa if it was Asia, if it was Europe. It doesn't look like it was North America, but maybe. I mean, they dispersed really, really rapidly across the globe during our, you know, the PETM phase, which is the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, which is when the planet got really, really, really warm and there were lush tropical rainforests all the way up to the North Pole. We actually find primate fossils now in the Arctic because it used to be actually hospitable for primates, which we know tend to be tropical animals for the most part. And we now mostly find them around the equator. And it wasn't 
it was just one of those fascinating stories that somehow lemurs got to Madagascar and then they went extinct everywhere else <laughs> on the planet. And so now we think of them as being this native to Madagascar animal, which they are, that is true. But in deep time, they actually used to live across the entire planet. And the question has been, well, how did they even get to Madagascar? And it turns out that the best hypothesis on this, even though it was quite a oceanic journey, is that they rafted there. <laughs> Some folks have been like, oh, it must have been a land bridge. However, there's no tectonic or geologic evidence to support that. And it turns out there's quite a bit of evidence, not just from lemurs, but a bunch of other animals that also made it to Madagascar, uh, like Tenrix and all sorts of uh uh, reptiles and things like that. And literally our best hypothesis is that they rafted there, that they got there via land raft. And it had to have happened that way. There's literally no other explanation that we know in the scientific community right now that could have led to this habitation of this giant island. Yeah. Lemurs. That's the topic of today's episode. Rafting lemurs, which of course does take us to Probably the first question that you might have when you hear those words. What is rafting? Rafting is a fun summer activity that both Amy and I have very badly guided. But rafting, when we're talking about animals, is very much non-consensual. And it involves being swept out to sea on rafts made of trees, detritus, leaves, garbage. Uh, and of course, in our modern era, literal garbage, human garbage, uh, floating docks, those sorts of things. So when we're talking about rafting, we're not talking about something that the lemurs were like, this sounds like a super fun summer activity. We're talking about this getting swept to sea and clinging to detritus and debris. And I still love to envision, though, a bunch of lemurs being like, let's go on a cruise this summer. Okay, <laughs> I can kind of, uh, I've heard about this island. It sounds really great. I love those images. However, right, that is not what we mean. Scientifically, when we say rafting, they're not, you know, holding paddles. They're not on on an actual raft, though that would probably be really funny to see uh, and probably not okay ethically to do. So instead, those images will retain in our brains. And we'll talk more about what the heck rafting in a natural sense, both modern and prehistoric means for the dispersal of a bunch of different types of animals across the planet. Yeah. So rafting, uh, it's usually when you have big, like, clumps of trees and things together in the ocean, which is also not consensual for the trees. That's not something that they choose either. So rafts usually form when you have something like a massive storm or a hurricane or, weirdly, uh, tsunamis will also cause these rafts. And rafts can be relatively large, uh, larger than you might expect. There have been some measurements of rafts that have been in rivers, not even made it to the sea, but in rivers that have been as big as 60 by 23 meters, which is two blue whales by one blue whale. Wow. If you're looking at like the blue whale system of measurement. I Again, I love to envision a bunch of lemurs on um, three blue whales that are like weaved together, woven. Anyway, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the size breakdown for my brain. I would not. <laughs> And those are like in river systems, you're saying? So are these like major rivers? And then eventually, are they getting out to the ocean? Or I mean, just I'm sure some of them don't even make it oh, yes. as far as to the ocean. Yeah, so uh, we definitely have seen rafts of trees and debris form uh, on the ocean. We've seen them form in rivers and then flow to the ocean. It's just that the biggest one that anyone bothered to go and write down and create a paper for, <laughs> because that's what you can do, guys. You can just go to rivers and oceans and say... I see a bunch of dead trees all kind of shoved together. Why don't I write a paper just about the size of that? Uh, so the only one of those papers that has come out uh, has mentioned that the raft was 60 by 23 meters. So that's the biggest one that has been recorded, probably because people seeing other big ones just didn't write it down because it's a weird thing to study. It's a weird thing to study and, and the grand scheme of how long humans have been around and been thinking about writing down the size of land rafts. <laughs> it's really not that long. Everyone has different hobbies, you know? We used to think that the oldest known piece of literature was Gilgamesh, but we were wrong. It's actually this document recording a land raft. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. 
so again, like, yes, whether or not it's been observed is fantastic when we can have that sort of evidence, but that doesn't mean that there aren't many occasions with bigger rafts or whatever that we just haven't seen yet. Yes. Rafting uh, has been proposed for a lot of different animals, but there's some reasons why it's been proposed for primates in particular for getting to Madagascar. So as we mentioned earlier, there's some geological and tectonic things that kind of linked all of the continents early on. So it was really easy to get in between places uh, and then split after that. I think we just need to clarify, there is no evidence that lemurs were on Madagascar as it was splitting off from Africa, right? Yeah, so... That was, I think, in the Cretaceous before lemurs were lemurs. Yeah. And were just a little little star in the dinosaurs eyeballs which they didn't evolve from dinosaurs so again i need to i'll just shut up <laughs> um you heard it here folks lemurs evolved lemurs. from dinosaurs oh my god i'm gonna get so much hate which from the fanboys you do realize makes lemurs and dinosaurs monkeys <laughs> I, that somehow makes dinosaurs more endearing to me. It does. So. It does. <laughs> so, okay. So Madagascar split off from Africa before lemurs came around on the scene, uh, which means that they had to get there, not by just sitting and watching tectonics slowly happen, uh, but they had to get across an ocean somehow. And the assumption is that lemurs, while I'm sure they can swim, Probably were not swimming across this massive ocean. At the time, it was estimated that it was like 430 kilometers between mainland Africa and Madagascar at that time, which is estimated to be about from 60 to 50 million years ago. I've seen other estimates that are more like tw maybe even 40 or 30 million years ago, again, because it comes down to fossils and genetic clocks and things like that. However, we know it was post dinosaurs. So dinosaurs go extinct 66 million years ago. And for everybody out there, I mean, the classic dinosaurs. Yes, birds are dinosaurs. I'm not talking about birds. She's I hear talking you. About I other hear monkeys. you. <laughs> <laughs> Flying monkeys. Um, Right. Non-avian dinosaurs go extinct 66 million years ago, which starts the beginning of the Cenozoic, the age of mammals. And uh, at some point after that is when lemurs somehow got from mainland Africa to Madagascar, crossing something that was about 430 kilometers wide between those places. And it looks like the papers I was reading is that because of currents and things like that, it really had to be like this perfect, a perfect storm, literally, in more than one way. Yes, not only did it take a storm, but it also took uh, the currents that are no longer going in that direction, just because, again, of the different places of where our land masses are, thanks to plate tectonics. And so it just happened to be that for those millions of years, there happened to be a favorable current that could actually push these land masses, these land rafts from mainland Africa eastward to Madagascar. And the papers I was reading estimated that it would have taken a few weeks potentially for these ones. And I think we're going to talk more about different time scales for different crossings. So this has been one of the longer ones that we ran into that it could have taken somewhere between like 25 and 30 days, which I have been referring to as like that epic season of Survivor without the annoying host. <laughs> ah, that'd be so nice. No Jeff. Wow. I'd actually watch that. And then just for our frame of reference, we're like, how can we put this in context? It takes people about 20 hours to swim across the English Channel, which is about 34 kilometers in distance there. So, I mean, we are talking about a sizable distance for any living creature to actually cross. So many blue whales across. So many blue whales. And when you look at a map, I think it can give you the wrong idea because it looks like Madagascar is just a little hop, skip and a jump away from mainland Africa. Africa. And it is not. It's even further away at this point. And again, the currents are not in our favor. So these researchers have really referred to it as like the sweepstakes event in which it worked out that just for this perfect moment in geologic time, like 20 million years, so not really a moment, but in the grand scheme of the earth, that's nothing that it happened to work out for these lemurs. And the other funny thing that I just read about is that it turns out that most of the lemurs seem to have gotten there around the same time, but it looks like one group of lemurs came on its own. And it's obviously because it was left out by all the other lemurs because it's so weird. It's so creepy. 
<laughs> and you know what, Lieber? Oh, no. It turns out that the I.I. I. Uh-huh. had to go on its own raft. <laughs> Nobody wanted the I.I. on their raft, so <laughs> I.I. ancestors had to colonize in a second event. Yes, but if you've seen an I.I., you might not want to spend 25 days on a small land raft with one of these terrifying creatures. I mean, I love them. They're fascinating. I got to see one at the Denver Zoo the other day, and again, I, like, cried. They're just, but they're really weird, guys. They look like they've been electrocuted. They have one finger on each hand that is creepy long, like eight inches long, that they use to, like, tap on wood and also apparently pick their own nose (sighs) it's fascinating (laughs) and they are a little bit terrifying if you really want to see you know you think all lemurs are cute but beauty is really in the eye eye of the beholder what Gollum is to hobbits is what an eye eye is to other lemurs yes like an eye eye is Gollum with slightly longer fur absolutely Uh, yeah that is and you don't You don't want to go rafting with Gollum. No, you don't want to go rafting with Gollum. First, he's not going to share any of his fish with you. (laughs) You're going to go hungry. Yeah. (laughs) I don't even know anything. I... Not a Lord of the Rings person. But I'm like, that was pretty good. I was really, uh, really excited that you could understand even that amount of uh, Lord of the Rings talk. But, you know, we got to give some love for these eyes, guys. We got to appreciate some of the animals that might not be so charismatically beautiful. I mean, they're charismatic in kind of like a reverse psychology way, I'd say. Yeah. That's really the eye. Yeah. Yeah. So to go back to the point that you asked, the distance is about 430 kilometers. A lot of blue whales. A lot of blue whales that I may be trying to crunch the numbers on right now. (laughs) Oh, I think it's going to be about 14,333 blue whales. (laughs) All right. So it's probably about the world's population of blue whales suspended end to end from Mainland Africa to Madagascar. That's a long time to be on a raft, too. Right, exactly. So how do these animals survive these journeys? You know, like, is there food? Is there water? Like, how do they how do they handle this? Yeah, so, I mean, we do know this in part because we have seen animals arrive in new places via this rafting system. So as outrageous as it all sounds... We have seen examples of rafting in modern animals, including some things like black rats, which is the most metal rat. Uh, We've seen uh, mites. (laughs) Mites have rafted over. Uh, Mites from Japan rafted all the way over to Canada after the tsunami in 2011. We've seen alligators that have been picked up by hurricanes in the United States. And there was one alligator that was transported uh, over 400 kilometers And the only reason that they knew it had been transported, other than the fact that there were no uh, other alligators there, is because someone had tagged it about a month prior. (gasps) So it had a tag so they could tell how far it had been transported uh, by, yeah, by this hurricane. This is nightmare. Nightmare fuel right there. The fact that you just might end up with an alligator in your swamp just because of a hurricane i mean i again like to envision them actually like being up in like a tornado like situation and then being deposited but again i don't think that's it doesn't mean that because hurricanes can generate so much force with just moving things around on the water and surface right is that what that's how this alligator would have yeah yeah so they suspect that probably the alligator was kind of involved in one of these rafting events so i don't think they found the actual raft they just found the alligator after it had um debarked from its raft. Uh, So probably it was caught up in a whole bunch of trees and things, got swept out to sea, and then they found it in Texas. And this is far from the only modern example. Um, And so I'm going to tell you one of my favorites right now, Amy, because... I'm so excited. Uh, So it is very funny to me because it is the invasion of the iguanas, uh, which happened in some islands in the Caribbean. And it happened in 1995. Uh, And it was an island that had never had green iguanas on there. Um, Can you guess how many, what is the number of iguanas you would constitute as an invasion? Mm, As an invasion. Let's see. Invading force of iguanas. The one time I went to Mexico and definitely paid for those pictures of an iguana, Mm -hmm. um, I just 
I bribed the guys to let me hold as many of the iguanas as possible, even when they were clearly very uncomfortable with me. And it turns out it's because the iguanas wanted to hurt each other. Um, It was not because I couldn't handle it. So for me, like that was three iguanas. So I'm going to have to just start with, (laughs) which they're great photos, great pictures. Wow. Wow. For me, I'd have to say an invasion starts with three. That's enough. That's plenty. So three by itself is apparently not a very cohesive force of iguanas. Um, This was 15. So 15 iguanas showed up uh, in 1995 in the Caribbean. And they later discovered that they had come from a different island, uh, Guadalupe, over 100 miles south. And they had been, again, swept up in a raft by a hurricane. And they had been on the open sea for a month before they arrived. So how many iguanas were there at the beginning before they <laughs> that ate is each other? True. <laughs> they did find one of them was pregnant. So uh, one of the iguanas was going to be able to make more iguanas. Uh, and they, they did try to capture and kill as many of these invading iguanas as possible because iguanas, like many reptiles, can carry salmonella uh, and iguanas are particularly uh, nasty to native wildlife. So even though it is very funny to me to envision 15 iguanas arriving on a bunch of logs and constitute that as an invasion, uh, truly could have been very detrimental for the animals uh, of the island. Um, so, yeah, they worked real hard to catch those invading iguanas. Real and th- hard. And this just goes into, I don't need to go on a full tangent here, my entire definition of what an invasive species is, uh, I think it's been very tarnished by my background as a paleontologist, because I'm like, okay, I get it. The iguanas are not great for that native ecosystem. However, if they had rafted up a million years ago, we wouldn't even know. We would call them endemic, We would, which just means native to that area. And, you know, so I'm always like invasive on what time scale? And so this probably goes along with what you're talking about right now, where it's just like, is it always bad to have these new introductions of different species when in deep time there would have been no human ability to murder all of the iguanas after their exhausting journey you know like wow i've been on the been on the open sea for so long and i'm just met with bullets you know i, I don't so know. much hatred <laughs> okay i do i do i want to mention the lists of grievous crimes that iguanas can commit on these islands let's do it justifying the murder of these iguanas oh all God. right <laughs> first off the salmonella thing okay not that big a deal but not great uh second off they eat endangered native plants okay that's That's one of the primary things that invasive animals do that set them apart, that they actually cause damage to the local ecosystem that cannot be adapted to. So they eat endangered native plants, which is also the food of some of the endangered native butterflies. And (laughs) this one's my favorite. Uh, They steal burrows from burrowing owls. (laughs) That's crossing a line. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You could eat native plants, but don't you dare mess with my burrowing owls burrows oh no yeah. oh no not today satan not <laughs> today you stay away from our owls the only dinosaurs i like are the cute ones that burrow so oh, that's fair that's yeah, that's so not true. just those <laughs> i like plenty of birds i'm just talking smack yeah i do feel like being a paleontologist gives you kind of like a weird almost libertarian aspect ideology towards conservation Uh, Just because we see so many animals die, we're just kind of um, immune to it. So lots of animals we do know have rafted. um, And most of them are things like reptiles, smaller animals, so like insects and arthropods. But we do also know that because these primates ended up in places that they shouldn't be, uh, we do suspect that primates would have been able to survive on these rafts and had to have survived on these rafts in order to get over. Uh, And that it can't just have been once because we know that eye eyes show up at a separate time. They were late to the party. Um, So basically one area of research in recent history has been trying to figure out how do animals survive on rafts? How can you survive 25 days in the ocean? Uh, where you don't have fresh water. You might have food if you are eating your other raft occupants, uh, but more than likely you won't have very much food if you have any at all. 
So with primates in particular, there's a reason that we think that primates were able to survive this. And this is because a lot of primates can undergo what's known as torpor, which you have you haven't really undergone, but you know how if you have like a big turkey dinner or something and you just want to sit and just do nothing? That's like torpor if your body temperature just stopped maintaining itself. <laughs> so there's a lot of primates that we know now can undergo daily torpor and do so. Torpor is voluntary. So unlike hibernation where you have to prepare a whole lot and then you just kind of get kicked into it, torpor is something where you can be like, I'm bored. <laughs> I'm just going to stop burning energy. This sounds great. I want, <laughs> how do I? <laughs> the gray mouse lemur in particular, they've done quite a few studies on mouse lemurs to see how, how far they can drop. And the average body temperature of a lemur over the course of a day is 17 degrees Celsius which is 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh, that's pretty chilly for a mammal. That is the temperature at which I start freaking out in our house yeah. uh, because I can't stay warm while I'm at my computer. <laughs> my hands start to freeze to the keyboard. So yes, yeah, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And they fluctuate super hard too. So they have uh, fluctuations of about five degrees Celsius over the course of a day. So they will just kind of stop regulating their own body temperature. And then to warm up, they'll go sit in the sun uh, instead of wasting all of their energy. So this amount of torpor, they can also get down to 7 degrees Celsius, 7.8 degrees Celsius, which is 46 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can do that on purpose to save about 30% of their energy expenditure, which is really important if you're on a raft and you have to deal with not having water and not having food, being able to sleep it out and just be cold and not have it be a problem is an incredible adaptation that may have helped these animals get across the straits. I would have assumed any mouse lemur that I came across that was that cold was already dead. That's yeah. cold. That's like what so your cold. fridge is kept at. That's quite... Is it? Well, I think it's in like the low 40s, mid 40s, right? Okay. It can't be much colder because then you'll have a freezer situation, which I've done and frozen my string that's cheese. True, yeah. and it's, it's a hot bummer. So that's, I had no idea that they could get that, that chili, which is, yeah, yeah that is, wow, that's fascinating. That's do cold. You wanna, do you want to know how they research that? I do. Of <laughs> course I do. I'm like, are they just finding really cold mouse lemurs in the wild? Or are these studies like on a captive? Gun. Yeah. <laughs> They move well, but they're probably not moving fast when they're that cold. I know that cold, they yeah. can on other occasions. So. so one of the problems in studying torpor has been that it's difficult to get lemurs in captivity to do it because they have pretty easy access mm -hmm. to food. They don't really feel like they need to conserve their energy. Uh, so the study that did confirm, in fact, that mouse lemurs have this, they caught a bunch of wild mouse lemurs and then they put them in like enclosures still in the wild. So they, they were still in their natural habitat and had access to sunlight and no sunlight. And they, they did a small surgery, which this was in like the 2000s. So the animals were treated very well, unlike some of the extremely crazy 1980s studies that I've also read. Yes. Yes. So this particular study, you know, they, you know, they get anesthesia and they're put under, uh, they put little radio transmitting thermometers in their tummy, like a little like thermometer troll doll. Isn't that weirdly cute? Yes. I mean, and mouse lemurs are so cute anyway. So that, that's just, I want images. I need to see what this looks like <laughs> in the studies. Wow. Okay. That is, that is, you know, what we will do for science. Cause I was, I was really worried you were going to go down some really dark, like 80s no, 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 experiment no. where they're no. like, and then they stuck them in the freezer and then they watched them die. Ugh. Um, which is, um, some of my studies that I'll be bringing up in just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It, trigger wording for what I'm about to say, but there, there is a 1984 study, uh, because one of the animals that does love to raft and gets places it shouldn't be uh, is anole lizards, the little lizards yes. that you find all over the Caribbean. Um, so they, they, I, yeah, um, they just put them in a tank of water to see how long they floated. <sighs> you know, it's the way things were, guys. It's not how we treat animals today. Um, yeah. It's also why you and I are paleontologists. We yes. don't have to torment anything. 
uh, for science to go on. <laughs> so, That's a major reason why I pursued yeah. paleontology. I have always loved animals, and I didn't want to watch my favorite animals go extinct, so I decided to just study the animals that have already gone extinct. <laughs> <laughs> because I am an overly emotional person and I couldn't handle watching tigers go extinct and know I had nothing to, you know, very little control. The weirdest form of self-sabotage I've ever heard of. I didn't want to watch these animals go extinct, so I decided to study their extinct version anyways. Yes, just yes. get attached to the dead ones. Well, I have to just take us down another tangent, which I'm realizing might be my role in this podcast. However, I love mouse lemurs, and one of my good friends in graduate school, she studied living mouse lemurs a lot and um, worked with some of the captive populations that we had at UT Austin as well as at Duke. And her research, actually, you saw one of her talks at SVP. She just had like the primate heads in the glove pictures, <laughs> and you just were like hysterically laughing <laughs> during her talk. And she, because she had to transport all of these like primate heads because she studies eyeballs like from point a to point b and so she just had all of these like decapitated anyway wow this is grim i didn't mean for it to go this way these this is a story about cute living mouse lemurs y'all so she was studying their eyesight and she wanted to understand elements of depth perception which involved needing to put an eye patch over one of the mouse lemurs eyes during these studies and she said that trying to put an eye patch on a you know very active mouse lemur who has very teeny tiny ears guys doesn't really have like a place for you to mount like there's nothing to hold your eye patch on to that and she would describe it as trying to like put an eye patch on a squirming potato and that that was the <laughs> biggest limitation to her study was actually being able to you know reduce vision in one side to be able to even do her experiments so mouse lamers she had some of the cutest pictures ever though I'll have to see if I can get some of them from her to share on social media when we go uh, to publishing little, this episode little pirate mouse lemurs which feels very very topic relevant for rafting honestly <laughs> exactly invasions pirates eye patches like right. yes uh, all right so we've talked about uh, the rafts are a thing that exists they happen in modern times they've clearly happened in prehistoric times we know that there are some adaptations that animals can do to survive these long journeys what about once they actually get there? I mean, is it just, you know, like... Scatter! <laughs> Rob Robinson Crusoe? Is it just like, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy? Or you know, what, what? how does that work? What do we need for it to actually be successful in a, the long term? Yeah, so, I mean, assuming that you're not an iguana and you have to scatter because people are coming to hunt you down, you have to somehow make more of you because one animal alone does not a species make. You have to have multiples of you. So that can either be that there are multiple animals and you guys can have bebes, or it can be that a pregnant one showed up, a pregnant animal on a raft, which it turns out that a lot of pregnant primates can also undergo da uh, daily torpor. Oh, so. Wow. And it sounds like I am a great raft candidate right now. Like yeah. I should be so popular if, you know, <laughs> we wanted to have an alive situation on the ocean with Jeff Probst and Survivor. Anyway, ideally we have some animal that is knocked up yeah. on these rafts or enough in the population or in this invasion, like 15 iguanas would seem to cover your bases there too. Yeah. They also, part of the reason that this has happened more frequently to reptiles, other than the fact that they're cold blooded, they can really slow down their metabolism is eggs can also potentially be transported just by themselves and potentially survive. Of course that makes sense. Okay. Okay. I mean, what is an egg if not like, you know, like a little life capsule it's supposed to keep you alive Right. It, Even on the ocean. And especially if you're a <laughs> reptile who just, you know, leaves them and weeps, you know, like it, it's just where if they don't need to be incubated or if they're buried or something like that, and that's already going to be sustainable on this epic oceanic adventure. See, I'm so tra I'm so caught up with placental mammals that I didn't even think about eggs. I was just like, how would they do it? <laughs> yeah. So pregnant animals uh, or hopefully a breeding population, although of course, regardless of the breeding population size, it's its not going to be 7,000 lemurs showing up on the island all at once. So there's going to be some um, <clears throat> bottlenecks that happen. 
in that population so, uh, real fast. So, uh, Megan, what do you mean by uh, bottlenecks? I'm going to make you say this. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, inbreeding. Inbreeding is better than no breeding. Uh, <laughs> no matter what you end, maybe Targaryen lemurs. You're getting Targaryen lemurs towards the end. That's a Game of Thrones reference, Thank Amy. You, I know I, that you don't watch that I show. I appreciate so there's it. There's too many beheadings. I know. I get nightmares. <laughs> I mean, I had this unfortunate idea that that's where this was going. Because I mean, like, sure, you're pregnant, but if there's only like, does is this an Oedipus situation? Like, oh, I gave birth oh, yeah. to a boy, and now that's our only... I'm so sorry, everyone. But this is animals. <laughs> like, this is what has happened over and over again. And so genetic bottlenecks is a phenomenon that we see because of the ability to study DNA more readily these days, to be able to see that there are periods in a lot of animals' lineages where they go through very small amounts of genetic diversity and it's likely because they were forced to to resort to inbreeding to stay alive so yeah yeah, this is not an endorsement (laughs) since we're already on a bummer topic um granted these episodes are always going to come ebb and flow between the bummers the thing that i've always been fascinated with this uh, with this idea of rafting is like okay obviously it has worked right we are talking about all these examples through deep time and modern day where it works. How many times do you think a land raft has shown up on a new piece of land with just a ton of dead lemurs? You know, like how many times does it not work before it actually does work? You know, like it can't all be successful. And I, I hate that I go there, but I'm just like, well, if it worked once, there must've been a bunch of times where it did not work well. That's why it's a uh, sweepstakes. It's going to be some yeah. failures. Sorry, everyone. Not everyone grows up to be able to go to Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. So who we have covered a lot of really fun topics today. And, you know, I think let's talk some more about some of these fun examples of different animals is that lemurs are not the only animals that uh, have history with Madagascar. And one of the other ones are chameleons, the fascinating lizards that are able to change their, their lizards, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Those are lizards, We are keeping right? that in. Nobody is allowed to cut that. That is, that is being I kept like in. mammals. These are the experts that are bringing you this hard hitting talk. This is why we need a disclaimer at the beginning to not believe what Amy says. Uh, <laughs> lizards, right? Oh, man, I'm embarrassing myself. Um, I like to quiz my husband on these things, and now I'm losing. Anyway, chameleons, they're cool. They can change their colors to blend in with their environment. They've got kooky eyeballs that can go in different directions kind of like a mad eye moody effect and uh yeah they are their greatest diversity of chameleons in the entire world is found on madagascar and yet it's similar it's like the same kind of debate with the lemurs of did they originate in madagascar or did they originate in mainland africa and then get over to madagascar and then conquer the world because they've also (laughs) been quite successful outside of africa as well And this one's been cool because it does look like it's debated. But one of the papers I was reading that's more of the more recent research on it is looking at the fossil record of chameleons. And they actually found a fairly complete chameleon skull in mainland Africa at this really famous Miocene site that's called Rusinga Island. And that it's a part, it's off of Lake Victoria, I want to say. And again, though, I didn't know it, what, what, chameleons are so maybe we should fact check that but anyway they have found a complete chameleon skull there so now and it's miocene site so we're talking like 15 million years ago or so and uh yeah they're saying that well that's pretty good evidence that hey that's a pretty old chameleon skull and we don't have older fossils of chameleons on madagascar so can we use that fossil to tie them to actually originating in mainland africa And then it's just really fascinating because it seems like there's a lot of back and forth within this debate. Like there seems to be that there was indoctrination, if that's the right word here, between Madagascar and mainland Africa, like a lot, which is another thing that I feel like gets glossed over a lot with pop press and whatnot. And that with paleontology, when you're talking about tens of millions of years, yes, it can go both ways, just like Megan. So (laughs) thanks. (laughs) However, 
animals can go back and forth. It's not like it's a one way street. It's, it's very rare that it's like, no, you can only go this direction and you can't go the other direction. Like Bronotheres, which are these cool rhino relatives with crazy horns that they don't know if they originated in Asia or North America. And it's like, well, who cares? They went back and forth a bunch, you know, like what is the significance of that? And so that's kind of the deal with chameleons too, is that it turns out that, they probably went all sorts of ways. And then it's pretty clear that they didn't stop there. They also then went from Madagascar to the Seychelles islands and were able to cross a good chunk of those oceans and chameleons, man, this is just a lot of respect. I do have a, another surprise animal of an animal that rafted. One of the other animals that may surprise you that has successfully rafted uh, is in a very well-named paper the first substantiated case of transoceanic tortoise dispersal. <laughs> it's to the point. You can't argue with that. Uh, so this is from 2004. Uh, and a giant tortoise was washed up onto the shore of East Africa. And they think it came from an island about 740 kilometers away, which is even more blue whales. That's so many blue whales. So the tortoise itself, what is what is even weirder is that it did not come with a raft it floated the whole way <gasps> because sometimes you can be your own raft and so this tortoise they knew that it had been in the water for over seven weeks because it grew barnacles on its <gasps> legs and they could date how long it had been in the water using those barnacles so it was fine they uh they just fed it and gave it some water uh tortoises can survive for months without food um so yeah it just <laughs> just floated its way to Africa. I just love that because, I mean, when we think of tortoises, and we'll talk about sloths at a later episode and their interesting dispersal as well, because they have some surprising means of getting from place to place too. We think of these animals as being very slow and very, you know, terrestrial, well, you know, tortoises. Uh, and it, it, it is just so funny to think like, well, no, a tortoise, like I can totally see that. Like they've got the goods, man. They've got the ability to just... Yeah, you know, chill out. <laughs> Put Just on a relax good for seven straight weeks while barnacles seven. grow on your legs. Wow. And I just, when you started saying that, I like, especially like, it's like no raft needed. I just started envisioning all of these, you know, like motivational workout posters that are, you know, like <laughs> quitters never quit. <laughs> like just a tortoise is floating in the ocean all alone. Just keep floating. <laughs> keep calm and float on. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, tortoises. Man, I just. I always say you should respect your elders, everyone. Tortoises have been around for so freaking long. We really need to give props where props are due. And this is just another reason to appreciate the tortoises in our world because they don't even need a raft. Like, psh, 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 I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Yeah, these slow animals. So, well, I mean, bringing it back to primates and some actual monkeys, because I know that you want <laughs> me to say monkey. So here we go. We thought that going from mainland Africa to Madagascar was a far journey. Well, it turns out that the best hypothesis for how monkeys got to South America is also rafting across the entire Atlantic Ocean from yeah. Africa, yeah. which is crazy uh, that they were able to make that journey. Now, it's hypothesized that this successful rafting adventure actually it turns out it probably happened a couple of times yeah. uh, but it happened probably about 40 million years ago which is in the late eocene which is the best time period in the cenozoic if you good. ask me yeah. it's pretty great it's when we see the emergence of a lot of our cool modern animals and they're real just fun anyway we find fossils in South America, I think specifically in Peru, which is, you know, um, I think the site that they found them in is quite a ways away from the coast as well. So we're not talking about just like washed up and died. We're talking about like made it, probably had some fun inbreeding, and then made it even further inland before they were fossilized. And, and again, to even have enough 
of a population where a small portion of them can be successfully fossilized and then actually be found, you have to have a pretty substantial population to even be able to get a representative in the fossil record at all. And so obviously they were doing quite well in South America and they're like, how did they get here? Because there are no fossils that show them like uh, migrating from Europe via to North America, because that's where we have a big gap in our primate fossil record in North America. And it's not that we don't have the rocks and the, the right ages. If they were there, we would think we would have found them by now. I'm not saying it's out of the question, but most North American primates are, again, those prosimians. So a different evolutionary branch of the tree. They're not true monkeys yet. And they go extinct by about... 43 million years ago or so in North America. And then these ones show up in in South America 40 million years ago, and there's no record of them coming down from North America. There's no record of them coming across from Antarctica. So literally, there's no land bridge hypothesis out there that would be actually possible. And so again, it is probably a land raft that would have traveled across the Atlantic. And I will say that the continents were a little bit closer together at that point. So it wouldn't have been as far. However, it's pretty clear because of the type of primates that we see present, the monkeys, is that they are a group that was only known from Africa, the parapithids. And then all of a sudden we find parapithid material in South America. And they're distinct because they have slightly different teeth than other monkeys do that currently live in Africa. And again, it was like one of those cases where these parapithids were doing pretty well. They were doing well in Africa. They made their way to South America. Then they went extinct in Africa (laughs) and then continued to evolve and diversify in South America. So what's really cool is that the South American monkeys actually have a more, I'm just going to say it, primitive dentition Mm -hmm. than what we see in actual African monkeys today. And that's how we can kind of do this detective work to know, well, this dentition didn't exist except for in this pocket of Africa at this small window of time. So somehow those monkeys made it over to South America and then continued to do well over there. And now South American monkeys have very distinct dentition from uh, the old world monkeys, as we call them. So yeah, teeth, oceans, inbreeding. Come on, everyone. You're going to love All of it. Amy's favorites. <laughs> That's the end of my primate pontification for this podcast performance. Thank you, Pop Filter. (laughs) Thank you for listening. If you like the podcast, be sure to rate and review us on your listening platform of choice. We really, really, really appreciate it. If you'd like to hear more and support the show, you can follow us on Patreon for some exclusive bits or on our various social media platforms. You can follow Amy on Instagram at Mary Annings Revenge. And Megan on Instagram and TikTok as Geopedal Fabric, or both of us at Weird and Dead on Instagram and TikTok. This podcast is brought to you by the Geology Podcasting Network, produced by the Traveling Geologist, aka Chris Spencer. Our theme song is Unlock Me by Praz Kanal. You can follow them on Spotify, P R A Z K H A N A L. Cover art was provided by Chris Spencer and the host. Editing services were provided by Abby Jansen and Chris Spencer, and a little bit of us as well. And this has been hosted. Hosted and researched by us, Amy Atwater and Megan Weatherall. Thanks for listening. Uh, Amy is going to go immediately after this and do a really deep Google dive on lizards. You know what's really depressing is I have worked with chameleons before, <laughs> yeah. so I have like no excuse for this. I, I have worked with chameleons at two museums now, so I really, I'm ashamed. <laughs> but also proud because I don't want to know everything there is to know, y'all. I got other things to do, like quilt.